Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is Deborah Smith Pollard. We'll be discussing her latest book, When the Church Becomes Your Party, on contemporary gospel music. Welcome to Rip Rap, Deborah. Thank you for inviting me. This is a fun book, but first I thought it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about, you have all these roles. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, scholar, gospel announcer, concert producer, churchgoer, maybe I'll talk some about that in itself. Okay. Well, I'm the daughter of uh, two musicians. My father is deceased now, but that's how my mother and father met um, as students at Northern High School. They went on to Wayne State. They started a choir with some others called the Twin City Chorus. So there's always music in our home. Um, then he became a pastor. And so, you know, it was always around sacred music, but we're also around classical music and jazz and everything else. But it was just gospel that really spoke to me in terms of what I would do with my life, my research life and my avocation as a gospel DJ, AKA gospel announcer. And uh, then for 22 years, I produced the McDonald's Gospel Fest. In fact, we have the oldest we have one in the country in uh, Detroit. And then a partner of mine, uh, Mike Watson, and I created the Motor City Praise Fest. So for 22 straight years, we were outside doing gospel festivals. And so that's kind of how I got, I guess the scholar part. Um, I did some work with Michigan State University Museum. Um, they heard about me through some friends after they went to the Smithsonian one year. Long and short, at one point as I was presenting, their director said, you should come and do a PhD. And next thing I knew, I was in a PhD program. And after I finished that one, I got hired by U of M Dearborn campus, which is where I've been since September of 1995. But there's a whole interesting thing that you also discussed in your book about gospel announcers. Maybe explain a little bit more mm -hmm. about that. Well, sure. We work on radio, but also in the live setting as MCs. And uh, most, oh, I shouldn't say most, but many of us prefer to be called announcers as opposed to DJs. Uh, many of my colleagues say DJs just spin music, where we like to encourage, exhort, and inspire using using the Bible as well as using the music that we play. So depending on whether you play very traditional gospel or more urban contemporary, I'm on an hip hop and R&B station and I'm the only one that plays gospel so mine tends to lean more toward the urban contemporary but still I try to select music that is going to encourage inspire and, and you know, even entertain a little bit so that's what we do and then as I said we MC in the live setting as well well and you had quite an interesting history about where that all evolved how the gospel announcer you know oh sure yes well actually gospel gospel music and radio um, kind of come up together like as early as we've had uh, from the earliest days I should say of radio there's always been um, those religious broadcasts and in those early days it didn't matter whether you were black or white you just listened to whatever was there because there was no television so this was an exciting new medium and if you were spiritually inclined you'd listen and it turns out that those programs that had more gospel music in there became more popular. It was new, you know, people think about the Negro spiritual, that comes out of the period of enslavement. But once um, black people start moving from the farms and the plantations during slavery, they move into the big cities. And so they need new music. So they create jazz, blues, and gospel. These three come together and they're not really as separated as people like to make it, but that's a conversation for another time. Um, but as I said, as they have this new music on radio, those programs that have gospel become so popular. After a while, those who really liked gospel music didn't want announcers, DJs who were like um, Brother Man Jones in one program and then Brother Jones or Deacon Jones when he played gospel. They wanted somebody who was always focused on gospel. And so that's how our role kind of evolved over time. 
We well, talked in the book too about Martha Jean the uh, Oh yeah, the, the Queen. Martha Jean the Queen. My goodness, she was just maybe the fourth woman who was hired at the first station in this country that was aimed at quote unquote Negro appeals. Um, it was to appeal to Negroes at that time. That's where black people were. And um, while the other women were initially hired to do homemaker kinds of shows, Martha Jean the Queen was tall, statuesque, had this throaty voice. So they decided they would tailor her program for men. So they called the program Premium Stuff and she was Prince's <laughs> Premium Stuff. And when I interviewed her, she said, kind of sexist, wasn't it? And I said, yes, ma'am, it was. And one day during her program, because while now many of us, you know, run everything, we run our boards and we produce our shows and all of that, um, she had an announcer and the announcer was about to, you know, introduce her. And she said, if you say that name again, your behind is mine. And he said, well, the boss gave you that name. She said, I don't know, find something else. And so he opened the mic and said, ladies and gentlemen, Martha Jean, Martha Jean the Queen. And that's how she became the queen. That's a great story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was, it's, uh, the um, beginning of the book, too, you were talking about how you got this title from Claudette Manners. Yes. Claudette Manners uh, used to make clothing for what I call the gospel divas. Um, and among them were the Clark sisters. Um, some of those who are watching may even know of them. They won three, count them, three Grammys last year um, at the Grammy Awards. And I think it's the most anybody in gospel's ever won at one time at any rate. Back in the 90s and before then, for quite a while, if you were a gospel diva, you had lots of bling, okay? Lots of sparkling earrings and beads on your gowns and all of that. And so I was interviewing Claudette for some work I was doing for Michigan State University. I work at U of M Dearborn, but I do research with MSU as well. Anyway, I was talking to her and I said, well, why so much you know, glitter? Why so much beading? And she said, well, when the church becomes your party, and I just started laughing before she even got finished with the sentence. She said, you know what I mean? She said, you know, when this becomes, when the church becomes your party, you bring your party clothes from out in the world into the church and there's never too much beating, there's never too many sequins. And if you were into tailoring, there's never too much tailoring. And so I never forgot that line. And so, you know, fast forward many years and at first, my publisher wasn't quite feeling that title, but I th and she was, they wanted to go with something like essays on gospel music, and I thought, no, oh. no, no. So, <laughs> and so what I did was I wrote the preface and sort of explained what the title means. And when people say to me, now that's a good thing, right? When the church becomes your party, I said, absolutely. I said, you know, in what we call the world, in the church community, um, there's a phrase, there ain't no party like a, you know, um, but in the church we say, ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party, because the Holy Ghost party don't stop. And so somewhere during the course of an event, it can be a church service, it could be a gospel musical play, it could be a concert, somebody may talk about the praise party, you're getting your party on. So it's about the celebratory intentions that we have when we come together within the church setting or within the gospel music community. And also the way I read it, when, when the church becomes your party, yes. not the party or no. someone else's, no. it's your party. your own personal place of celebration. Yeah. Um, I, I, um, artists as diverse as Kirk Franklin, who people know came out of hip hop, he was a break dancer and he's perhaps our most um, successful artist of the contemporary era, something like 12 or 13 million CDs sold so far, or somebody like Take Six who um, come from the gospel slash jazz community. I remember um, they have a line in the song, we're rocking the party because we've got the victory. So it shows up all of the time within the discourse we have within gospel music. And I know as a scholar, I'm supposed to distance myself, but I'm a child of the community is also a child of you know what a PhD program so it all kind of comes together that way well and that element of praise and worship I mean that was this this thing that was throughout the book that was a distinctly different dimension it's not really like separate but it's how it like refashioned element. yes in fact that's what I thought was important to bring up is that 
the phrase itself, praise and worship music or praise and worship service comes from the white evangelical community. But as I not only did my own research, but talked to many of the individuals whom I quote within the book, um, for example, someone points out that those who were enslaved honored God as they were working in the field or when they worshiped by themselves. They may not have called it a praise and worship service, but they certainly knew that there was this big God that they were praising and honoring. Uh, let me see that even in our old devotional service, while it had a very different sound to it, we had the almost always all male deacons in the Baptist church who were lining out these hymns and sometimes very uh, minor keys. Um, and a lot of the younger people weren't quite in love with that sound. And still there was a time to kind of pull your mind in from whatever you had done outside. But praise and worship music um, in many ways is almost a world music. I mean, there are sounds that can come in from Holland and from South Africa and from all over the globe and instrumentation of Kurt Carr, I think on the last one, he had an accordion, he had xylophone, just all kinds of instruments. For some people, it's a unnerving because they want the quote unquote black church to always sound as it has. But for many, they've really jumped on it. Now, some people call it bandwagoning, but I say it's been here for more than 20 years. So I don't think we should call it a <laughs> fad. I think we should just say it's been an interesting turn and in how people have decided not only they want to start the service, but also there, there are whole programs that are just called praise and worship services now. So it's a very interesting addition to what uh, we've pulled up. And, and some of the terminology, I want to add this, this is the other thing. Many of the terms are from the Hebrew um, text. So they talk about Shabbat and Barak and Tehillah. And so you've got some interesting things happening, an older body of, um, of uh, congregants who don't know what the heck that means, you know, and this new group thinking, oh yeah, we're doing this. And I'm thinking, that's not new. That goes all the way back to the Torah. What are you talking about? So um, we've got all kinds of interesting layers, things coming in from um, African diaspora, things coming in from, um, you know, the Hebrew, you know, worship experience and then being created on top of what the evangelical white church had, had um, created and adapted for today's contemporary black church. What I picked up on the, at the beginning of the book, you said you didn't deliberately aim to be provocative. No. But on the other hand, <laughs> as this was coming in to the church, it had this, <clears throat> um, because it's a transforming kind of an experience, it did have this very distinct element to it. Oh, Not everybody was comfortable with it. No, in fact, um, not only do I, you know, look at what some of our leading national artists have done with praise and worship music, people like Israel and New Breed and Byron Cage and William Murphy III, but I also look at some very specific churches on the cover. We have um, from Pastor Marvin Winans from the famous Winans family. I wanted to see what was he doing with praise and worship because um, they're known for being contemporary in gospel. So how are they incorporating? I went to a, a small church called um, Greater Christ Temple, um, which is a, a Pentecostal congregation. So what were they doing? And then what used to be called the St. James Baptist Church, because they had done many national recordings with the sound of the Baptist worship experience. And so um, there, uh, sometimes the minister of music, sometimes the praise leader talked to me. And I remember at St. James, the um, the young minister of music who was only 21 at the time said, oh, some of the older saints said, can't we sing some of the old songs? And he said inside of himself, he thought, no. <laughs> <laughs> but then he heard one of our um, revered um, bishops within you know, the gospel slash Christian community say, Mother Jones is never going to come around to understanding Shabbat Barak Tehillah. She's not going to understand that. So make sure you include something. And so what I talk about is this inclusive model that I found in many of the churches that while they say it's a praise and worship service, they'll reach back to some of the older hymns or some of the older congregational songs. So that way everybody or most people can feel as if they can be a part of that praise and worship experience. Well, in one of the appendices at the end, you show that, you know, it's not necessarily totally right. praise and worship, just sort of bl a blend. Ex absolutely, mm. absolutely. That you were 
reflecting on the wide variety of sounds, like you were saying, the performance styles mm -hmm. and controversies <laughs> that come from all that interaction. I oh, think. yeah. Well, it's it's um, really quite an interesting world within gospel music these days. We, um, for those who are around, as I was not, when Mahalia Jackson was in her heyday, I mean, there was Mahalia Jackson, there were Claire Award singers. It was pretty, you know, it was all pretty traditional. There were quartets and there were female singers, you know, basically, and then there were choirs, and then the choirs got to be big. But now we have all these subgenres. We call them uh, traditional, new traditional, contemporary, urban contemporary. We have gospel jazz and we have praise and worship. That's six different subgenres. Now, all of it has has to have a certain text um, in terms of um, praising God for Jesus Christ and talking about living a certain kind of lifestyle. But the way they get to that text, you know, the terms of the instrumentation, the attire, all of these things help to, you know, suggest what genre, genre you're listening to. Some people listen to it all and that's fine. Some people only want to hear what sounds like what they were singing the day they came into the Christian church. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see some of the tensions that exist, but also to see how some people who were pretty set in their ways have decided, well, okay, maybe that sound isn't so much for me. Well, I can give that to my grandchildren or I can you know, share that with some of the younger people I know. And they see the effect of and the younger people the loving the fact that they don't have such a disparity between what they listen to outside of church yes. and what they're listening in the church. And you know, it actually has never been as disparate as people thought. Um, it's just that if you were not raised in the day of Thomas Dorsey, then you don't hear the sound of the blues in his music. If all you know is Precious Lord, then you think, well, that doesn't sound like the blues. Well, you don't know some of his other songs and you don't know what he played before. Like when he was playing with Ma Rainey or when he was arranging songs like It's Tight Like That, Okay, this is why there was that real push against what Dorsey was doing at the time. They knew he had been in the clubs during the week, and then he's bringing those same chords into the church. And so what I try to tell my students in my class on gospel music is that if there can be gospel blues, which is what he called his music, there can be holy hip hop. I said, now, don't say that as your parents are writing out the check for your tuition. <laughs> if they're really against it, just keep that to yourself. But know within yourself that there has always been this tension where what people thought was worldly comes into the church. In fact, church people don't live in the church. They live in the world. And so even if they're raised in a home where people say you can't listen to hip hop, you can't listen to R&B, they're going to hear it because they're going to school. They're going to work. They're going to have their car window raised, you know, roll down, and somebody's going to play something that's going to attract their attention. And that's how we get this, because it's from a community of black musical people. And we create these sounds. And as Pastor Winan says, there's no gospel B-flat chord. There's just <laughs> B-flat, okay? And so after a while, these sounds just kind of come together, you know, so they're people out in the R&B world who say they listen to the gospel show so they can steal the runs and the riffs. And then there are people in the gospel world who, you know, pay attention to what's new in terms of instrumentation or presentation in the so-called secular world. And all of it comes together in ways that are pleasing to some and sort of disconcerting to others. Well, I notice that when you talk about the holy hip hop that there's, I don't want to call it tension, but there is this interaction between the hip hop secular hip-hop and the holy hip-hop. Oh, absolutely. And one of the uh, challenges those who are in Christian rap slash holy hip-hop or who are Christian rappers, there's so many names, it's not one name that any that everybody within the genre holds to. But one of the challenges they have is that people think, oh, Christian rapper, so you must sound like, and they'll name some of the more traditional singers. And then what some of the um, Christian rappers run into, of course, is that while they may sound more like Jay-Z, they're placed in a bin next to Shirley Caesar or <laughs> the Mighty Clouds of Joy. And what they want is for somebody to see them with their Tims, with their jeans, et cetera, and, real, and say, oh, that looks interesting, and to pick it up. It's more likely they would pick it up if they could be placed alongside of 
Jay-Z as opposed to being placed alongside of more traditional artists. And then of course there are those who just think that all of hip hop is about gangster rap, which it never was and it still is not, although that may be what um, is the most commercially uh, promoted. It's not what most of the you know rappers are about. But when parents, church people hear that, they're like, that's just, one of my colleagues said that to me Sunday. He walked into my studio and, he's, and he, was, he said it jokingly. He said, that's not even of God. And I said, well, why would I be he playing knows, it? For you sure. know, he knows for sure. I like to listen to the lyrics. And so that's why I took time in that particular chapter to lay out lyrics that um, they can see that, okay, in Christianity, people believe that we are going to heaven after this. And so I look at a set of lyrics from the cross movement and they say, one day we take off baby. Now that may not be the way your preacher said it last Sunday, but it's the way he can reach or that group can reach their core audience with that same message. Um, and so it's interesting, as I say, to be grown, that's all I ever tell people, grown, and, and, and work at a station with 20 and 30 year olds and to overhear what they're playing and to listen in, within the gospel music community and see how this synergy works in terms of who's borrowing what from whom. And I never say anybody's stealing, though there are some of my um, contemporaries in the church world say, why do we have to take from you know, the world? And I guess my answer is, we're all in the same community. You know? So we create these music forms together and we've decided that we're gonna make this dichotomy, this is sacred, this is secular, when in fact, that's a false dichotomy that certainly did not exist in West Africa um, that was kind of superimposed on us once we got here. And if we can just say it's the text that makes it, you know, something that you might play on a Sunday morning, it's not the beat, it's the text. And so that's what you have to pay attention to. So in my class, we always say, get past the jeans and the Tims, or get past today, maybe the cleavage on some of the singers, okay, and listen to the lyric, and that'll tell you, oh, she's gospel, or oh, maybe she's more over here on the r well, I also side. Th thought that was fascinating. It's about perception, because yes. many of the lyrics in the hip hop is going faster, mm -hmm. and you talk about that, that if they, if they could slow it down a little bit. That's Pastor Winans' line again, and I, I, the reason I quote him is on Sunday morning, as I said, he's an icon around the world in contemporary, but I am fortunate enough that for the last four years, we've been neighbors on Sunday morning. I work on WJLB FM 98. He's at our sister station, which is 92.3, The Mix. So we can walk right across the hall from each other. <laughs> so yeah, that's the one who said, that's not of God, okay. And, and he's the one who said now, he respects the research, but he does. And I knew when he said, but you may not agree with the summations. Well, that's it. When I say, think of it that is holy hip hop as a lingua franca for young people, okay? It's the way they communicate. It's their music. Now, you don't have to gravitate toward it. Why don't they slow it down? If they slow down, they will be judged negatively the way the early hip hop Christian rappers were. People say, oh, that is so tired. That is just so not what the rest of us are doing. So now we've got young artists um, besides Kirk Franklin, who is not a rapper per se, but who includes many elements of it. And that's, he's been that bridge between the church world and the hip hop world. But um, the truth, the cross movement, um, Lecrae, who's the first gospel rapper to debut at number one on the gospel charts, um, which is really big because a lot of my colleagues will not play Christian rap on their programs. So um, there's this interesting change. It's only been 35 years, <laughs> okay, but okay. But at least um, there are people who are paying attention to this music, the young people that I believe these artists are trying to reach. And uh, I think that's a good thing. And, and if people like Pastor Winans, he does have a couple of artists that he'll play occasionally, then, then at least he's not completely closed off to it as unfortunately some have been, but I've seen some changes. And all I wanted to do was sort of arm those grown people, as I call them, with enough lyrics so they could see their testimonies 
and their lyrics are as strong as someone who came out of, you know, the 1945 so-called golden age of gospel. And if they love God that same way, and if they're dedicated, because if they could be out there singing another kind of music, but if they're dedicated to this, then why not give them an opportunity to come and minister to your young people? Um, or, as I said, share it with the young people in your own home. Excuse me, talking about the roots of of this, uh, you know, in the context of African, African American, uh, such features as the ring shout and spirit possession and the static religious stance. I mean, uh, there's these elements that have come out of the past. Oh, absolutely. And so uh, I remember the first time we were at a gospel fest, one of the events I used to produce. And I mean, the group was, they weren't just doing what I call the choir sway. I mean, they were out and out dancing. And I could hear some people, it doesn't take all that. Well, what I try to do is, you know, just remind people that throughout the African diaspora, dance and music go hand in hand. It's like, if you can think about when the very dignified Nelson Mandela was freed from prison, and there he is, not just speaking, but he's dancing with the people at the same time. Because it's an expression of joy, it's an expression of who he is, and it's an expression of what the community is about. That's how people throughout the African diaspora express joy. It's also how they express their love for God in certain contexts as well. And so, you know, being reminded that even though um, when the enslaved Africans were um, you know, brought to this country um, and or to the New World period, and they were told, thou shalt not dance, okay, which meant crossing feet. Then they create a ring shout because many of them believe, well, how am I going to praise God if I can't praise him with my whole body? And so ring shout is created and, um, you know, we continue with the call and response and all of these things. And so, as I said, even though we think, well, this is 2009 and we're just so far advanced from all of that stuff back there. To say no, and let's not think about it being advanced or being separated. There's still this cultural connection that if you'll just take the time to get past the layers of, like I said, the Tims, the jeans, the cleavage, whatever it is that seems to be blocking you, if you pay attention, you will see there are still those elements, those Africanisms that remain in much of what we do. I thought it was also interesting when you were talking about the gospel of plays or drama. <laughs> that Well, that's also being in the life in a, in a real vivid way. Oh, absolutely. Um, on the day that we are having this conversation, uh, Tyler Perry's latest film is coming out. Tyler Perry is absolutely the king of today's contemporary gospel plays. That's where he began his trek toward being a millionaire. And now he's a friend of Oprah and he's got Phil, Dr. Phil in his films and all of this. And yet he, I go because I'm always curious, is he going to step away from that spiritual message? And no, even in the new one, which is Medea goes to jail. Medea drinks Hennessy. She carries a pistol. She will curse people out and all of that. She puts the, I'll say the behinds and the chairs. But on the other hand, there are other people around to her, her who always have that spiritual dynamic. They're seeking something. And at some point, even Medea will say, you've got to learn how to forgive. You know, you're so caught up in your anger, but you've got to. And she'll, she'll later on tell people, as soon as church has a smoking section, she'll be there. Well, like I said, it's a fun book. Yeah, well, I'm I glad. really enjoyed reading it and <laughs> getting a whole other version of it. Well, thank you for being on Rip Red. Well, thank you for inviting me. Mm -hmm.